path. Welcome everybody to um, Yong Shen Tso's talk. So it's a pleasure to welcome him. He did his PhD with Venka Chandra Sakharan at Caltech. And then afterwards, he had to go back to Singapore to a surface country and be a research scientist at the Institute of High Performance Computing. And at the same time, he's also assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at the National University of Singapore. And um, his interests are in dictionary learning, but not, you know, the vanilla variety, which is simple, but more complex things where you also have structure in the matrix and you have to do a lot of complicated things. So to Yong Sheng to tell us more about these things now. Okay, Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, can you hear me well? Everything's good? Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for the kind invitation. And I also uh, I've personally enjoyed the uh, seminar series. So thanks a lot to uh, this bunch of folks for organizing, putting this together so that uh, we can uh, gather all of us across the world to uh, learn stuff. Uh, so this talk is going to be about uh, symmetries and invariances, invariances as they arise in a range of data processing problems. So what do I mean by this? Oh, um, let's start with the top left hand corner. So um, this picture over here. So what you can see is that uh, you see a series of photographs of the same cats. Uh, well, clearly it's the same cat, but under rotation, uh, under different like, uh, poses or rotations. And so as a conceptual level, uh, I'm interested in the question whereby like, um, can we develop principal methods, principal algorithms for um, recognizing that these uh, photographs actually belong to the same object just under different uh, poses or rotations. I can pose a similar question on stuff on the right-hand side. There's the rotated MNIST uh, data set. So you might want to ask, like, um, can you develop algorithms or methods for recognizing that some image patches uh, are just belong to the same digit, handwritten digit, maybe it's a bit deformed, but nevertheless the same, just under uh, but just under different rotations. Okay. Uh, here's on the, on the bottom left-hand corner, it's a ECG signal of uh, some human patient. And so here's a different question, which is, uh, can I sort of learn a single waveform? So like a single spike uh, that you see in a typical ECG signal, in which you want to, uh, what you want to think about is that like, I want to learn a single waveform. And I want to think of this like an ECG signal as the superposition of a series of these uh, spike waveforms. Bearing in mind that this signal uh, itself, it doesn't copy like analytical copies of the waveform, but maybe this waveform contains a certain so it's different variations because of noise in the measurements or because of the uh, certain deformations because of an onset of some condition like uh, atrial fibrillation. So okay. you have a bunch of these waveforms. Nevertheless, you just want to learn one common waveform. So you can think of these sort of problems. Now, uh, this idea of using symmetries, this idea of uh, just recognizing that symmetries and variances uh, arise in a range of uh, applications such as these. It's a very basic, very natural thing to do intuitively. But it's one that actually uh, gains a lot of traction um, uh, in a lot of problems. So just an illustration um, in image processing task, uh, image recognition, say, uh, convolutional neural networks have been observed. And it's known to uh, like, um, deliver state-of-the-art performance in these sort of tasks. And the convolution neural network, really, you can actually think of this as just a regular neural network but with the shift invariance, so like uh, the convolution operator sort of bakes in shift invariance. So you have shift invariance back into the architecture, also plus the fact that uh, you have uh, this depth here, but it's just this basic ingredients of just baking and including all symmetries for the dictionary, dictionary learning problem. So let me begin by uh, describing what the, what the dictionary problem is mathematically. Let's, look, let's consider this. Uh, mathematically, given some data set Y, so can, we, can you see my cursor? I saw how we can, yeah. So, so given some data set Y, so when you imagine this Y is just collection of vectors in the dimensional space that represents some sort of data. The goal is to learn some linear map, a common linear map D such that, uh, Every data y is well approximated as dx for some sparse x. So let me reiterate, 
why is the data that you are pro provided with, maybe these are images, maybe these are audio signals, or maybe this a uh, uh, bunch of anything that you have. This is the input that you have. Uh, the unknowns are the D and the X simultaneously. The goal is to find a common linear map D so that um, every Y is well approximated as DX for some sparse X. The, now, the way you want to think about this is that uh, once you learn such a linear map D and the corresponding uh, sparse X for every data point, what this means is that um, your data Y is effectively well represented as the uh, linear combination of just a few elements of, of, of D, a few columns of D really. And that's because if you think about what happens with multiply D and a sparse vector, what you're actually really doing is to pull out a few columns of D. So the interpretation is that like, um, for example, in this image patches on the left, uh, what I'm saying here is that like uh, every image patch here is well approximated as the linear, linear combination, linear sum of just a few elements on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side are the columns of D. That's interpretation. Now, um, the reason why people study or at least work on dictionary learning is in a sense uh, primarily motivated by the importance of sparse representations in a widespread of our applications. Uh, so we use sparse representations for doing data compression. Uh, we use sparse representations. They're very good for uh, doing denoising, uh, uh, denoising, uh, denoising uh, uh, stuff, um, perhaps using some sort of thresholding operator or some sort of total variation minimization. Uh, if you have some sparse prior, you can actually use that prior to do some sort of like a filling of uh, missing entries. You can also use that for sort of like a superposition. Uh, sorry, what did I say this? No, uh, super resolution, sorry. Now, underlying all these methods or underlying all these methods for doing all these problems is, the, uh, is that they rely on the existence of some sparse representation for the data. That is, uh, if you know what the sparse representation is, then there is a very good algorithm, uh, perhaps one based on like, uh, but that one, there's a very good algorithms that exploit this pass, uh, these sparse representations to complete these tasks. So this is uh, where dictionary learning comes in. This is where dictionary learning shines, which is uh, in some settings, you may not have access or you don't know what a suitable uh, sparse transformation is. And so what dictionary learning does is to say, well, hey, I have this data set. Can I learn the dic uh, dictionary or its transformation so that data becomes sparse? And once I learn that transformation, then I can apply all my favorite techniques that have been de developed for all these uh, applications. And you can uh, do all this stuff, data compression, denoising, et cetera. And so with that, um, let's think about uh, trying to incorporate uh, this sort of invariances or symmetries into the dictionary learning problem. I mean, let me, let's begin with the simplest type of uh, uh, symmetry invariance that you can possibly think of. And this is the shift operation. Okay, so what do I mean by shift here? So here a shift is to take uh, this vector here, as you can see, and just perform a cyclic shift of all the entries here by one coordinate. So uh, start with A1 to AD, I perform a shift, and so it's A2 to AD, and then the A1 pops up at the back on the right-hand side here. Right, so the question is, um, can I learn a dictionary that has this uh, shift invariance property whereby if I have an, a vector A that is a column uh, it's, it's a column in this uh, D, this linear map D. Then what I also want is that uh, all shifts of this vector to also be present in that uh, linear map as, as a column in the linear map. So that, that's a constraint that I want. Okay, so that's the uh, shift in, uh, it's what I mean when I say, I want to learn a dictionary that obeys a shift invariance. So what you can think of is that like, uh, effectively what this has is that, uh, what this means is that like, let's consider this linear map here, this cartoon over here. Uh, whereby we have this uh, bunch of columns on the left-hand side. You think of this as a canonical set of our columns. And then when we say that we want shift invariance, what it means is that we also want all shifts of these uh, dictionary, uh, these columns to also be present. Uh, so in the second bunch of columns, I have a shift by one coordinate, the next one shift by two coordinate, and so on. And so this is the type of structure that you expect you have in the dictionary. And so what uh, learning a dictionary that has shift invariant entails is simply to learn like just the same dictionary learning problem. Um, you are given data Y, uh, you want to learn linear map D and X, but with the additional constraint that D should satisfy this sort of structure that is given in this, uh, in this uh, picture over here. So that's what uh, sh learning a shift invariant uh, dictionary uh, entails. Now, 
Uh, it turns out, okay, so it turns out that shift invariant dictionary learning has been studied very widely. Uh, it's actually better known as convolution, convolutional dictionary learning in the literature. And that is because uh, operations with shifts are more naturally expressed using a, the uh, convolutional operator. So that's actually the name that, that people go by. So, so you if, if anything, the official name is the convolutional dictionary learning. And so there's been a widespread of work uh, on many fronts. For example, in one front, um, on, on the application side, because uh, this sort of shifts or convolutions are very natural for modeling signals in audio processing as well as uh, uh, image processing task, uh, either in the temporal domain or the uh, spatial domain. So there's one trust actually develop lots of applications based on uh, convolutional dictionary learning. And then on the other hand, there's also the computational aspect because uh, when you have this convolutional structure, the problem becomes a bit more complicated get sort of bigger dictionaries. And so that this necessitates a different line of work uh, developing on the uh, computational side, uh, how to uh, exploit or just uh, get around the difficulties that arise from convolution. And then more recently, there's a bunch of work. Uh, so this is a little bit, uh, some, some, a little bit of work, uh, re more, rec more recently on, on the, um, uh, the uh, analytical side. So that's coming up as well. Now in this talk, uh, my focus or the main question, the key question I'm gonna ask is, uh, uh, can we extend the ideas of convolutional dictionary learning to more general symmetries? Uh, that is, can I learn dictionaries that respect more general symmetries? So it's one thing of is that the symmetries is something that you specify. And the question is, uh, can I learn a dictionary that would satisfy uh, such a symmetry? Uh, it's at any point if the people have questions, so feel free to uh, interrupt and ask. Right, so that's that's the main question I asked. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just saying because you said people should ask questions if they want oh. to. Um, oh, you can either type the question in the chat and then we will repeat the question for you or you just uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, so that's, um, so that's the main question. What I'm going to do right now is that um, what I'm going to assert to you is that um, really the key difficulty of going from shift invariance to more general symmetries, extending to more general symmetries, really arise when we go from finite symmetries to infinite or continuous symmetries. So that is, the difficulty really goes from the finite to infinite symmetries. And let me tell you why. Okay. If you go back to the cartoon over here, okay, let's, let's suppose that your diction, your, your symmetry is actually finite. Then what you can think of in principle is that like, uh, you could just do the same thing, so to speak. Okay, so like um, uh, here I have shifts, uh, I have uh, some canonical elements on the left-hand side. Then the linear map will have all uh, shifted copies of this element over here. If the symmetry is something else other than shifts, but nevertheless finite, then I could in principle uh, enumerate all transform copies of this uh, canonical elements. Okay, so for example, if there are shifts plus reflections, uh, then I will have this linear map here, this picture, uh, this, this map here, plus another copy com comprising of all the, the reflections of uh, this element, so to speak. Okay, so uh, the details to be dealt with, but uh, basically what I'm saying is that like, at least in principle, this idea of enumerating all the three elements could in principle be extended to all uh, any sort of finite symmetry. So in that sense, uh, it's not too difficult. But uh, this sort of breaks down when you go to uh, continuous symmetries because you just cannot possibly enumerate all uh, dictionary elements. So out of luck, you can't actually do that. And so this is the basic difficulty we have to overcome. Now, a second question, uh, it's also important, which is that like, um, if someone comes along and say like, uh, hey, I want you to learn a dictionary that that uh, respects this particular symmetry. Now, you as a, like a, maybe a data analyst or like an optimizer will ask, okay, you're giving me the symmetry, but how can I express this symmetry in a way that is amenable to optimization? Okay, so this is also an, another important point. Now get to this towards the end of the talk. Let's do the first one, which is how do you extend, how do you go from finite to a, a for infinite or continuous symmetries? All right. so. Uh, broadly speaking, the, this is where sort of, like, let me give a sense of where the difficulty arises. Okay, so this is what it, um, this arises in something known as sort of the sparse coding step. So consider this problem uh, whereby you are given some fixed linear map D. Okay, so just fix D for now. Then given a vector Y, find a sparse X so that Y is well approximated. Uh, it's closely, uh, it's close to, uh, Y is approximately 
uh, can be approximated by dx for some sparse x. So now if you think of this d as being fixed, uh, this is a, some people call it a sparse coding step. This is uh, typically a subroutine. This will be a subroutine that you use to compute, uh, to do in, to perform in dictionary learning. Just, just, just looking at this form, then you, you might you will ask like, uh, how do we generalize this step, this particular step, when the dictionary that we want to learn contains infinitely many uh, dictionary elements? So this is uh, something to think about. So what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to introduce a bunch of notions, language, so to speak, uh, that will unify this question of dictionary learning that is both consistent for finite as well as infinite symmetry. So I'm going to introduce a bunch of things that will work for both finite and infinite. So some basic things first. The first, the first, we define a dictionary to be a collection of vectors. A dictionary is defined to be a collection of vectors, just basic building blocks from which uh, data is well described. Uh, is, is described. Uh, this collection is arbitrary. It can be finite. It can be infinite. It doesn't matter. Second, we say that a vector y is sparsely represented with respect to this collection, a dic dictionary d, if y equals to the linear sum of a few elements from D. We say that Y is sparsely represented with respect to a dictionary D, collection D, if it's expressible as a linear sum of a few elements in D. So uh, here I wrote Y equals to sum of CI AI. Uh, AI is uh, elements in the dictionary. Uh, I, the calligraphic I is the index sets. What I want here is that the index sets share very small cardinality with respect to say, for example, the uh, dimension of the ambient dimension of the uh, data. So this is uh, what I mean by this. Um, now, just to give a sense of what's going on, what's, uh, what's going on here, some special structured cases of D, if D is the uh, collection of standard basis vectors, then the corresponding sparsely represented uh, vectors, objects, in this definition are just sparse vectors. That's because uh, some of uh, linear sum of a few of these things are just sparse vectors. Second, uh, if D is the collection of rank one matrices, so UV uh, vector, so UV transpose is a rank one matrix, let's say unit norm, then the sparsely represented objects are the set of a collection of uh, low rank matrices. Okay, so uh, here, what's interesting is that uh, this collection of low rank matrices, matrices are infinite collection, they're infinitely many uh, rank one matrices. Nevertheless, uh, these, the objects that are sparsely represented with respect to uh, low, uh, this, this set here, D, is an interesting set, it's a set of lowering matrices. It's not a set of all matrices. It is actually a very structured set. So this is, uh, so what I'm saying here, the point being that like, uh, it is possible to get, uh, start with an infinite collection of, of vectors here, S or D, and still get very interesting uh, objects that are sparsely represented by an infinite collection. So it's possible here. Uh, with these two things in place, then the dictionary learning problem can be posed as follows. Whereby uh, we are first presented with a collection of vectors, that is our data set Y, as before. Um, it could be your uh, images or your uh, audio signals, anything. The goal is to find a dictionary D, a collection D, so that every data Y is close approximately it's close to being sparsely represented with uh, re represented with respect to D. Okay. So the goal of dictionary learning is to learn a collection D, this D here. It could be finite, it could be infinite. The finite one is what we're more familiar with. The, we want to learn a, diction, uh, a collection with the property that every data Y is going to be uh, close, very close to being uh, sparsely represented with respect to this collection, you can sum of the elements in D. Now, uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, introduce some other assumptions here that will make uh, help us make progress into our symmetry, uh, this, uh, this dictionary learning problem with symmetries. Uh, first, 
I'm going to first assume at least uh, require that the symmetry we are interested in, the symmetry that we want to impose in the, in the learning problem can be expressed as follows, whereby the transform object can be expressed as the linear transform acting on the original object. So this is what I mean. Uh, this, let's, say this is the, let's say this is the original object and this is the transform object. What this assumption asserts is that uh, this transform object can always be represented as a linear transform. Linear transformations will be some matrix, some operator acting on this object. So there's an, uh, it's an operator or a matrix that takes this to this. Moreover, what I also want to assert is that like uh, this linear transformation should be independent of this, uh, of this object, meaning that if there's a transformation that takes this to this, then I would also want the same object to take like uh, this object to this object. So this is what I need. So this is the first, the first uh, stipulation that I want. This is the assumption that, that, that the, the symmetry that we have should be expressible in this form. Linear transformation that characterizes the, uh, the just the transformation acting on any input object. So this is the, uh, the line here, it's the, sort of the, maybe the more mathematic form, uh, G acting on X is rho of G, some transformation uh, acting on uh, multiply, uh, multiply, uh, uh, multiply with X. So uh, as example, uh, if your symmetry are shifts, coordinate shifts, then this can be represented as a left multiplication by a, a circular matrix uh, as we see over here. So circular matrices are just matrices with uh, this uh, diagonal with, uh, this diagonals with some ones over here. It's like a permutation of the, uh, uh, it's a permutation matrix, like almost like a permutation matrix. Uh, if you think about what happens here, if you multiply a vector on the right hand side, then what you're effectively doing is that, uh, you, is that uh, you pull out the bottom coordinate to the top and you shift everything down by one. Okay. So this is like what the multiplying by a circular mat uh, matrix does. This is the second assumption, which uh, it's very benign one. It uh, concerns what is known as finite generation. Uh, roughly, roughly speaking, what, what it is, is that uh, we require the dictionary to be this form, uh, just a row of G acting on A, where A uh, belongs to this finite collection. Okay. So, so basically what it's saying is that uh, there is a finite collection of canonical elements and your dictionary are just like uh, all transformed copies of this canonical element. So AI to A1, AQ, some canonical elements, there are finitely many of them. And a dictionary is just going to be all transformed copies of these uh, finitely many canonical elements. Okay. This is just a very benign assumption. I'm just going to call this a finite generation. And so if I have such a dictionary, it's clear that it has this invariance property and that like um, I have an element A and D, then any transformed copy, it's also automatically in this D here just by construction. Okay. So let me just, with that, uh, let's go down to uh, why, why this matters here. Uh, so this is the punchline that I want to make here at this point, which is like um, learning a dictionary that respects symmetries really should be thought of as learning a, co a collection, a bunch of these generators, that is A1 to AQ. Okay, so it may be that the symmetry that we care about uh, could be like uh, something that is, uh, for example, uh, uh, Continuous, for example, like uh, maybe I want, if I want this object to be inside uh, as an atom, then I also want all, con all shift or all rotations inside. So mm -hmm. that, that the potential that could be infinitely many. Sorry, was there a question? Someone speaking? No, okay, yeah. So I could be in a setting where there could be, a, the, the symmetry could be continuous. So in principle, the dictionary, the dictionary could be infinite. Nevertheless, we can have can have a, a grab on handle on this problem because uh, if you think about the problem not in the dictionary but in terms of the generators, then this problem is finally parameterized. The problem is about learning a collection of, of generators, and that is what the problem, and that's sort of the right way, to, the right spirit to think about this problem. Okay, I think I see a question here. Uh, here we also assume that. Question? Yeah. Yes, uh, um, do we assume that symmetry is not a priori? Yeah, think of this as like you are the data analyst and you sort of believe a priori that like um, you, you want to learn a dictionary that uh, respects, let's say some rotations because you work with some image processing applications and rotations are natural thing to impose and you do that. So yeah, so I'm assuming here that you know what it is. 
you decide beforehand that you want this to be in a constraint. Okay, so this is the setup that, 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 yeah, that I'm working with. Think of this as like a, a sort of a, this G as a desirable property that one. I can talk, we can talk about this later on. So let's let's go, let me go back to the uh, problem here. So earlier I mentioned that this past coding step was this uh, difficult thing here. Uh, we had this uh, given y and a linear map d. We want to find x where x is sparse. So how do we generalize this? So here's the fix. Uh, fix as follows: given y and some dictionary d, the goal is to find y tilde where y tilde is close to y but with the uh, constraint that y tilde is sparsely represented with uh, this, this dictionary D. So this is what we do. We find y tilde where y tilde is close to y and is sparsely represented with respect to the dictionary D. Morally speaking, this y tilde is playing the role of this dx over here, except that I'm gonna talk about y tilde. I'm not gonna talk about dx because if I talk about dx, I'll get in trouble. I will not be able to talk about the case when like for infinite dictionary. So I just want to avoid parameterizing uh, calligraphic D altogether. And so I won't talk about Y tilde. This is the right way to think about this. If I want to go into like, uh, I won't even deal with like infinite dictionaries. So how do you find this? So it turns out that you can actually find such a Y tilde by solving a convex program. Uh, this is how we can do this by solving sort of a, a, this uh, proximal operator whereby we solve an uh, optimization that combines both a least squares uh, penalty term. So y minus Z, uh, zx, this encourages a solution to be close to y, uh, plus an additional penalty term here that encourages some sparsity with uh, respect to d. All right, so I'll explain to you, I'll explain what this norm here, but basically what you want to think about is that like uh, you have, uh, what, what this optimization problem does is that uh, it is something that will return to you, something that's close to y, plus it, that it's also sparse, uh, sparsely represented with respect to D. Okay. So what is this norm here? Uh, in short, it is a generalization of the L1 norm, uh, which is well known, uh, widely used for encouraging sparsity, as well as the matrix nuclear norm that is used also to um, induce a uh, Lorentz structure in matrices. It's a generalization of this, this penalty term here. So this is what this term here would, would, uh, is and what it would do. Right, so let me describe quickly what this norm is. Let me describe what this norm is. So uh, here, uh, recall that y mid sparse representations with respect to D, if it's a linear sum of a few elements in D. Suppose that there is a, okay, so this is definition. Given such a D, the regularizer or the convex function that is effective at inducing sparsity is given by this function over here. Now this function is a mouthful. So let me just tell you the high level thing you want to remember, the intuition you want to remember. This function is a norm. It's a, it's a convex norm. And the level set of this norm, or the uh, norm ball, is the convex hull of D. So the level set of this function is the convex hull of D. So take the convex hull, uh, that defines a level set, and with that, you can define the whole norm. That, that is, bro broadly speaking, what, what uh, this definition does. So it's known as the atomic norm. Uh, some you can call it the gauge function or Minkowski functional for uh, people in different communities. There is, a, so, but there is this, there is this norm. Uh, let me just say a few background things about this norm over here. So it, as I said, it generalizes uh, sparsity and uh, lower, sorry, the L1 norm and nuclear norm for sparsity and low rank, uh, respectively. If D is the collection of sparse vectors, then the uh, structure are sparse vectors. Sorry, if D is a collection of standard basis vectors, then the corresponding structure are sparse vectors. And if you go through a crank of the definition, uh, you get pop up, the, the, what pops out as the regularizer is the L1 norm, which is uh, something that you would expect. Uh, you can perform the same crank with, um, with uh, D, uh, D being the set of all unit norm rank one matrices. Structure will be lowering matrices, and the associated regularizer is the nuclear norm. You can do this for a bunch of other structures as well, such as your set of a rank one uh, tensors. You get a tensor nuclear norm. You can do it for permutation matrices and orthogonal matrices. You get uh, other 
other associated regularizers. In our setup, uh, the regularizer that we care about is, is uh, so just copy and paste the definition. The definition, the regularizer that we care about is this function over here. It is the uh, norm that is induced by the convex hull of the dictionary elements. So just a copy and paste definition. You take all dictionary elements, you take the convex hull, that is some convex set, and you define your regularizer. That is, uh, just copy and paste. Now, so with that, we can go back to our problem. Uh, we can find a y tilde by solving this, uh, uh, what is I said, solving these, uh, these uh, proximal operator, this convex program, where this uh, term here, D, is uh, where this uh, norm here, the, the penalty function here, is what I have on top. Now, uh, with that, this is all good, except that uh, this still leaves this question, which is like, uh, how do we implement this function in practice? So what I've said, described here is something that conceptually is a good idea. It is something that will be effective at uh, finding a solution that is indeed sparsely represented with sparsely represented with respect to D, except that I can't actually sort of write this or code this up for specific examples of groups. Let's say, uh, can, I, can I code this up in MATLAB or Python? So, so how do I actually do this? So this is still, still something that's missing. So this is what we do. Um, what I'm gonna do now is to introduce like a alternative char characterization of the norm, not in data space, but in linear transformation space. Okay, so then what I do now is gonna uh, give you an alternative characterization of the, the penalty function. Now consider the collection of linear transformations rho of g. So these are the uh, matrices, the, the operators that represented the uh, transformation. This resides in, not in data space. So data space is where your data resides. This is not in data space. This is actually in linear transformation space. So rho of g, you can think of this, for example, uh, in as like a d by d, by d matrix. Although it, it's actually better than that. You can actually do some improvements. But we'll talk about that later. But you can do this. Uh, so think of this as some objects in linear transformation space. Next, uh, we define the corresponding regularizer as the, uh, norm, atomic norm, associated with this set over here. So you take this set, you take the convex hull of this set, this is a convex set, but in the linear transformation space, and then you define the penalty function with respect to, uh, with respect to this set. So this, this function here would uh, induce sparse representation, uh, sparsity with respect to this uh, row of G. So with that, um, we have this result here whereby the, uh, this norm here, the, the norm that we care about uh, uh, with respect to the dictionary can be described as the uh, solution of this convex program on the right-hand side over here. Now, this is a mouthful. So let me say, just describe the punchline you want to remember. First, question you will ask, why is this proposition, this, does this proposition actually uh, help things? Does it actually simplify the, uh, the uh, task for us? And so I want to say, I want to claim is that now this actually is a useful thing because um, for many examples of groups, and I'm going to talk about this in a bit, for many examples of groups, uh, the norm here, this, uh, this norm with this uh, subscript G is something that is reasonable and you can actually sort of specify this for many instances of groups. So this is something reasonable. You can do this. You can actually write down what this function is in Python or MATLAB, just call it up. Uh, you can do this reasonably for many examples of groups. So this is a good thing. So in that sense, this is a helpful characterization. Second, um, this norm here on the left-hand side is defined as the solution of a convex program. That is because the objective is a, a sum of a convex functions, so they are norms actually. And the right-hand side is an affine constraint, so very nice, uh, so linear, uh, linear constraints, this is good. Third is that uh, it decouples the dependency between generators and groups. Okay, so this is something a bit interesting here. You see, uh, the objective here, if you look at this convex program, the objective here is something that only depends on the group. There's no dependency on the A. So the, these, these uh, generators A do not, do not appear here. So just uh, so that the objective only depends on the group. The affine constraint over here on the right-hand side only depends on the generators and has no, depend, no dependency on the group. So this is something that's a, this is a conceptual thing here. The left-hand side here is a norm that is uh, describes like the dictionary, so to speak. 
But the right-hand side decouples, okay, so sorry, the dictionary contains both the uh, generators plus the, um, the group structure. But what I have on the right-hand side is that it, I can decouple these two components into just the uh, just something in terms of the uh, generators and another component in terms of just the uh, group. So these two things are decoupled. And this decoupling is useful later on as, um, for developing uh, an algorithm for learning such dic uh, dictionaries that uh, respect such uh, symmetries. Okay, so with that, um, you can do our copy and paste again. Um, we wanted to solve this problem over here. Then um, our or original problem was in this data space, um, the variable Z in data space. We then lift it up and transform this problem into the um, linear transformation space. And this is, and, and, and with that, we uh, apply the proposition and this is the resulting convex program that we solve. So instead of solving the top, we solve the one in the uh, middle. This is a convex program in uh, where the variables uh, z hat are now residing in linear transformation space. Uh, once you obtain the optimal solutions, we can recover y tilde uh, with this uh, through this relation. So this is how we actually get back uh, y tilde in practice. Now, with that, uh, we're now in position to actually state our full uh, dictionary learning algorithm. Um, if you recall, uh, this a here are the they, they represent the uh, generators here. So A were the generators in the beginning. Now uh, here I've assumed that the generators are fixed. And then once you fix generators, then you want to learn what the, what the Zs are and the Zs are. Uh, in a full dictionary learning problem, these, these uh, generators are also unknowns. You want to figure out what the unknowns are. And so the dictionary learning problem really uh, is a joint minimization over these variables Z and the variables A. Okay, so this is how we, uh, so this let me just describe the full problem uh, full procedure you are given as input some data y uh, d dimensional space the objective is to minimize this uh, problem or uh, this this objective over here where the variables are the, z, the z's and these a's the a's represent the uh, generators and the z's are elements in linear transformation space so these two are unknowns um, because these two are unknowns. Uh, we will do some sort of, uh, the, the typical way to do this is through some sort of alternative minimization in which in the first step, we will initialize with some estimate of the, uh, sorry, you have a question? I think it's a question. Okay, so in the first step, what we do is that we will um, initialize with some choice of the uh, generators A we fix that. So in the first time we fix the generators and then we optimize, we minimize over the Zs. This leads to a convex program. It is convex because of the least squares and a convex penalty function. On the second step, uh, we do what is known as the dictionary update step. In fact, actually it's the generator update step. We update the generators. Uh, we fix the uh, Zs here and we update the A. Now, um, a is, the A is only participate in the least squares term. So this really is a least squares and minimization. And after that, we do the usual thing. We alternate between these two steps and uh, we stop once we are happy with it. Right. Once you do that, uh, after when you're happy with that, uh, you get some output A hats and the learn dictionary is, uh, uh, learn dictionary is specified by uh, these uh, generators and all its transform copies. So these generators and all its transform copies, that will be the resulting dictionary that you learn. So um, with that, let me, let me summarize uh, what I've talked about. So uh, this is a lot of stuff that's heavy going and I admit. Uh, so if you're lost, this is a very good place to sort of like uh, summarize everything I've talked about in, in this slide over here. And it's as follows, which is that like uh, conventional wisdom tells us that the way or the, the way that we do convolutional dictionary learning dictionary learning with like this convolutional or shift invariant structure is to do it as follows, whereby we are given data Y and we want to learn linear map D and some corresponding set of uh, coefficients whereby the linear map D contains the, um, the, the generators as well as all the transform copies. So I have uh, some vectors, I have some shifter copies in the next set of columns and all possible shifts as well. This is what conventional wisdom, this is what we think about 
typically when we do con um, these, uh, convolution dictionary learning. Conceptually speaking, this linear map D here contains both the generators plus the group information. Okay, so the generators, which is like some bunch of columns, and also contain the group information in the sense that like uh, all the transformed copies of the uh, generators also inside this linear map D here. So it contains this sort of like two pieces of information. The X just are just the coefficients and it just measure how much of these elements are left used. What I'm proposing here, what we're proposing here is that um, these three components here should be decoupled in a different way, whereby we put the coefficients and the group together into one variable and we isolate the generators alone on the, right, on, on, on the other side. Yeah, so here the key thing is to learn more dictionaries that, that are invariant to more general groups, it is necessary to isolate the generators alone and you can actually do so provided your transformation, so the, uh, this is the first assumption, provided your transformation acts linearly on the uh, input vector. Okay. That's, that's why this linear transformation, uh, existence of this linear transformation was critical. Uh, so we can actually do this. Uh, once we do that, um, we put the coefficients and the group information together. And this is where we can like, grab a handle on for, for like uh, continuous symmetries. So this is really this, the, the main, I guess at least at the conceptual level, the main contribution. It is that we put the code is that we decouple the dependency of these three things here in a different way. Now, this is not to say that the uh, conventional wisdom thing is not useful. Um, and perhaps I'll just sort of say this maybe as like a sort of a rule of thumb, which is that like uh, the, the top, the, the, the original, the, conven the, the most typical looking like convolutional dictionary learning formulation is something that's sort of maybe a bit conceptually easier to think about. And I think for for computation purposes, when you, especially when you deal with like uh, funny dictionaries, this is a good method. And I think it just works perhaps probably much faster actually. Uh, it's, it's at least, at the very least, it's conceptually much easier to think about, think about, okay? But if the group that you care about is genuinely continuous, then you don't really have a choice. You just cannot possibly do this. You have to work with the, the, the latter formulation, okay? so. I'm not going to dismiss a lot of work, a lot of work on convolution dictionary. The top one is indeed a very good formation for finite, uh, finite symmetries, but with continuous ones, the only choice you have is the, the one at the bottom. This is how I, that, that's how I see it. All right, so can, are there questions at this point? Let me pause for a bit. If not, um, let me just maybe run through some examples and I'll sort of uh, wrap things up quickly. Uh, so, so some simple examples here. Trivial example, uh, the group is the trivial group. Okay, it's not just a trivial group, the identity, but I also have to add the negation because I want uh, sort of reflections or negations of the dictionary of the element inside here. Here's a simple group where the group is just a plus minus identity matrix. The associated norm is the uh, L1 norm. If you work it out, and that simply recovers the typical regular dictionary learning. So, Nothing surprising here. Just regular dictionary learning. Second group uh, is the group corresponding to the set of a collection of uh, circular matrices as uh, by multiplication. So this is another group here. Um, if you look at this group, you can work out what the induced atom atomic norm, the norm. This will be a norm on these set of all circular matrices. Okay. Um, the set of all circular matrices is a vector space. So you can end up, you still end up as a circular matrix. So the associated norm here is actually this, uh, the L1 norm. You take this absolute sum of all the entries uh, subject to the constraint that your matrix is of this form here. So this is what happens if you say like, I uh, want to incorporate shift invariance, then this is the result that you get. This is a this actually turns out to be a restatement of the more conventional looking uh, convolutionary dictionary learning uh, state, uh, formulation. People working in convolutional dictionary learning are more acquainted with this latter form. And really, uh, if, you, if one sort of just sort of a look, look at tracks, what happens to all these variables, then one can actually see that the top here, what I have here, is really a restatement of the, uh, the bottom of here. This is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So actually, it's the same thing over here. Um, we can, yeah, this is a restatement over here. But here's a third example, which is a, 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 an infinite symmetry. Uh, what I'm thinking, uh, what I'm this is uh, what I'm thinking about here is a continuous analog of of a 
shift invariant, a uh, shift symmetry. So um, right at the beginning, I talk about this uh, shift over here, uh, where like uh, I shift like a uh, vector by one coordinate to the because a cyclic shift of the core of the uh, entries by one coordinate. I can also consider like uh, not uh, shifts, but not by one coordinate, but by some continuum of a coordinate of a co continuum from like a, a can shift these um, these entries by a continuum not from zero to one coordinate, but through a continuum over here. Uh, the motivation of this uh, of this of thinking about like continuous shifts is based on like um, sort of a certain uh, signal processing uh, signal processing applications whereby like. Uh, Let's say you have a bunch of signals here. In some, in some applications where uh, the signal that you care about is actually like a truly continuous, but what you have are just like a finite uh, observations over at, a regular, at regular intervals over here. So um, the underlying signal is, is really, well, it's actually a continuous signal, but what you actually have are just a finite um, observations. And so maybe you want you want to ask is that like can I sort of infer what the true underlying signal is from this uh, like a finite uh, finite uh, set of measurements? And so this is a, for that reason it is natural to think about like a continuously shift invariant uh, symmetries. So in this setup you can actually express uh, such a group. Uh, you can actually express such a group within this framework. Uh, let me just maybe mention the. The, the few key points here, which is that uh, the group is more naturally represented in the uh, Fourier domain, and it's in, in doing so, uh, the group is can be expressed as uh, pointwise multiplication by some trigonometric polynomials. I think that's the first thing. Uh, it's a bunch of things that are a bit heavy going, so we just highlight the key points over here, which is that um, I have an explicit exp uh, explicit representation of the group, exp um, characterization of the group. The next thing I want is like, uh, can I also describe what the uh, the, the associated atomic normal, the associated regularizing? The answer is yes, I can actually do that. And it turns out that it can be expressed via a semi-definite program. Uh, this is a semi-definite program that express the, uh, the norm associated to continuous shifts. Um, this is gonna be a mouthful. So let me just main, main, mention the main punchline here, which is that um, this is a semi-definite program. The constraint is a PSD and Topitz uh, constraints. And why this is useful, that's because um, this is, this looks a bit nasty, but actually it isn't as nasty as it appears to be. Um, that's because um, we can actually, okay, so given a matrix Z, we can do projections onto PS, the set of PSD matrices. So very easily, you just take the eigen decomposition and then you knock out all the neg negative eigen eigenvalues and you set it to zero. Uh, the set of all topless matrices are a subset. So projecting onto the set of uh, topless matrices is just a linear operation. So basically, a projection down to the set of PSD matrices or the set of top base matrices are very simple operations. It turns out that you can combine these together, so bootstrap the way, and you can specify a very simple uh, first order method for solving these sort of uh, semi definite programs rather cheaply. And so the punchline here is that uh, this program may look nasty, actually isn't as bad as you think. That's because uh, this can be achieved by solving these two much simpler primitives. It's not as bad as it appears to be. So let me just show you some, uh, some examples over here. So this is what we did for like uh, some, uh, uh, some data over here with the ECG time series. Uh, this is uh, some ECG time series for a patient with a thing, uh, from, uh, the data is from PhysioNet. Um, the, so what we did, this is the original signal. Uh, we chop it up into like a, a, a small, uh, small times series of length about uh, 200, 200. So the data is in 200 dimensions. Uh, what we do then do is to try to learn some continuously shift and varying uh, generators over here. This is real data. So we don't actually know what is the appropriate number of generators that we should use. So I just try a bunch of uh, possible parameters. Let's see what happens when you choose like one generator to a, or three generators and see what we get. Okay, so these are the results that we had over here. Observe that like um, we get this, this spike waveform and it appears in all, all these uh, three different configurations. And so it might be a bit, um, sort of a bit more reassuring because it sort of tells us that like um, that this structure, this waveform structure seems to be a stable conclusion or stable uh, template that you seem to be learning despite this problem being non-convex. So what it seems, okay, so, you know, non-convex optimization, you may be worried about what kind of solutions you might be getting. Uh, what we found out is that like, even with various choices of parameters, we seem to get 
a result that is somewhat consistent across all these uh, initializations. So it's sort of a reshowing thing here first. Uh, second is a different com a comparison between different methods over here uh, on the top left hand corner is uh, just convolution dictionary learning. So just uh, integer shift invariance. On the bottom right hand corner is what we did, which is full, the full on fully continuous. Uh, in between uh, the other two ones are the uh, sort of some, it's what is actually an interpolated version. So um, Song, Flores, and Demaba did uh, came up with this uh, idea of like. Um, uh, doing a uh, sort of like a going somewhere between, they, actually they were the first people who think thought about working on like a, trying to learn dictionaries that were continuously shift invariant, and their method was like to think in terms of using some sort of like interpolation. And so, um, if you interpolate with twice the number of points, you get this uh, sort of waveform, and if four times the number of points, you get this sort of waveform over here. Uh, one quick thing I'll just mention is that like um, I noticed I saw all these waveforms that I. That we take quick pop out of the algorithm, and I noticed that like uh, well, this looks a bit more blunt. And if you go from the, from the first to the second to the third to the fourth, then you see that the waveform seems to get a bit sharper or more like more narrow. And so I was wondering like if this is uh, really something that's actually coming up, or is this just an artifact of the algorithm? So this is something I'm not entirely sure, but maybe this is one of our offer, and I offer a uh, plausible um, plausible explanation why this might be true. So at this point is just a conjecture over here, which is that like, uh, if you think about like uh, what happens with integer shifts is that like, if you have a lot of signals here with a very, very high frequency, for example, uh, and you have like, uh, another signal here that's also very close over here. So maybe not like this. Uh, so sort of signal here is very, very sharp with a very narrow spike over here. If you have very, if you have integer shifts and you, so you are only constrained to like that, Having this sort of signal as a dictionary, as well as like a, the next one being like with the integer shift, you have to jump like sort of very far away. And so the problem with having like a sort of a grid that's a bit too coarse is that you want these uh, integer shifts to sort of be simultaneously close to, to like uh, all possible spikes that you have in your data. And this is not quite possible. It's quite a bit difficult. And because of that, maybe you have to suppress your spike so, so that you can be simultaneously uh, close to all these uh, possible spikes. Whereas if you allow yourself like a full on, uh, like a continuous shift, then you, you are allowed to, uh, you, can have a, you can have a spike here. Then you can also have another spike here and um, here and so on. So sort of the additional flexibility that is afforded by having something as like a continuously shift invariant might buy you something that you were not able to do with a uh, discrete integer shift. So this is my conjecture. Just a conjecture, I'm not, I don't have a, like a much more convincing argument. This is just a best conjecture. So this, that's my disclaimer over here. Um, here's another example. Let me see what I'm doing time. Okay, now I have a lot of time left, so let me be quick. Uh, There's another, another example here with uh, where the data matrices, the group is uh, one left multiplication, orthogonal transformation, um, punch line here. Prior techniques do not work. Uh, that's because orthogonal group is a group that we do not know how to discretize. For continuous shifts, you can say like, okay, I, I, I don't like continuous shifts. I can also do a discrete version, which is convolution dictionary learning. That's a fair point. That's a, that's a honest, uh, honest that's, a, that's a fair point. In this case where the group is orthogonal group, there's no clear discretization. And so you can actually sort of apply prior techniques. It turns out if you sort of do apply our framework over here, then there's a very natural, uh, then the, the, the top one pops out the spectrum on, and it's actually very simple, it's the, the maximum single value. And in this, in this synthetic example that we have, uh, it, it works well, we just recover the ground truth dictionary in just a certain small number of iterations over here. Right, so uh, let me see a few more things here. Um, uh, second, uh, something I promised, which is that like, um, how do we express general symmetries? Um, those are the ideas of representation theory are actually very helpful. Um, so let me just mention the key punchline here, which is that like, uh, I made this assumption here, which is that like, uh, I assumed that one they are uh, all the, the transformation to be expressed as a linear transformation, sorry, the, the, uh, the symmetry to be expressed as a linear transformation acting on the, on some object. Then is, while it's stated as assumption, there is actually a principled way of figuring out what the linear transformation is, and that can be done using representation representation theory from, from mathematics. 
Uh, it turns out that this uh, linear transformation is known as a left regular representation. And so um, there's actually a lot of things that's known. Uh, and um, if you brought the, the ideas from representation theory, then lots of nice things pop up. So uh, let me just say maybe the, the main sort of like at a high level what these things are. Uh, most the most interesting example is when a group is compact and uh, the group is compact, there's a lot of nice theory that leads to nice consequences. For example, uh, it is known that the irreducible representations are finite dimensional and countable. That's a bunch of things in mathematics, but in for an optimizer, what it means is that we can actually write now finite dimension approximation and we can perform nice harmonic analysis on it. Second, the, uh, there's an extension of a Fourier series to uh, these sort of functions, uh, to do this sort of, uh, this sort of data. There's an there's a analog of a Fourier series, it's something else altogether. But uh, what is nice is that like, it actually also tells us um, these Fourier coefficients are, are matrices, but they work very well in optimization because uh, we still have this linearity property that is being preserved over here. I can talk about this offline, but uh, the nice thing is that like uh, there's a lot of things here in representation theory uh, that is very well developed. And it turns out that actually sort of a very, it works very well in our dictionary learning context in the, as far as the uh, learning or the, the optimization is concerned over here. And so the nice, so let me say this again. A lot of nice stuff in representation theory. And it turns out that for learning, for this dictionary learning with symmetries, it actually gives us a lot of nice uh, properties for uh, as far as the uh, learning pro procedure is concerned. Um, last thing here is that uh, there's also a nice connection here with this, this uh, area on convex algebraic geometry. Um, people study these sort of objects a lot. So if you consider an object over here, consider object, a vector in some space. And then you act on it uh, by it consider an algebraic group acting on this. So they have a group acting on this object that brings it to different places. And if you take the orbit and you take the convex hull of this of this set, there is some convex set, and it's actually known as an orbitope. So this orbitope is a structure that's actually studied a lot by my, a bunch of uh, the people in the convex algebraic geometry. People care about the optimization properties. People care about the uh, algebraic properties as well. So there's been a lot of, stud, a lot of like, um, work on this in this area. The main thing I want to say here is that like, um, this question about learning a uh, dictionary that is invariant to symmetries or some uh, this invariant, like uh, this group invariants, uh, they respect these sort of uh, group symmetries, has a geometric analog. And the analog is to fix this sort of object or an orbital to data so that the data lies near the pointed, pointed parts. So it's sort of this picture over here. I want, so like uh, the, the dictionary learning problem is like we're given data and I want to learn a, a dictionary. It's a geometric interpretation, which is that uh, I'm given data and I want to learn the convex sets where the data points lie near the pointy parts, this uh, pointy parts over here. If um, in the, the, in the uh, if I want a dictionary to, to respect some sort of symmetry, then what's happening is that like, um, I'm, what I'm requiring is that the, uh, the, the set to be an orbital that is suitably parameterized. So what I'm basically saying here is that uh, this uh, dictionary learning problem with symmetries has a nice connection here with uh, this whole literature on the uh, orbitals. Uh, last thing, maybe just a couple of interesting questions that I'm actually interested in. Uh, maybe I'll to mention a few things here is that like, uh, a lot of interesting connections here. I'll be happy to talk about it offline. So maybe I'll mention things that are perhaps Maybe I just mention the last one, which is this year, uh, which is um, so I'm bunch I mentioned a bunch of stuff here that do with atomic norms and, and uh, for doing like learning dictionaries. So there's a convex norm that will be able to useful that's useful for uh, like a use that is uh, useful in using sparse structure with respect to a dictionary that is group invariant. There are many other problems where these sort of symmetries and invariances pop up, like alignment problems, registration problems, uh, cryo EM applications. And so one thing I'm interested in is also like uh, do like uh, is is that like uh, are the techniques here also applicable? What are the connections between uh, this dictionary learning problem with uh, all these other problems? Uh, with that, I think this is a good place to stop. And um, these are the references over here. Uh, most of the talk is based on the first paper, and and some follow up work that is uh, on the on uh, with uh, on the dictionary. Uh, sorry, on representation theory aspects. Uh, this is done with my colleagues at NUS, in particular Subro and Aaron, who I. I uh, know a lot more representation theory than I do. Uh, the code is also available in GitHub and is maintained by Brandon. Uh, so thank, thanks a lot.